But now, ladies and gentlemen, it is my honour and distinction to introduce our next speaker. <clears throat> this is a gentleman who was imprisoned before I was born. And by the time I had reached nursery school, or maybe primary school, <clears throat> and he was out of prison, he had not only done his school degrees, he had got two degrees, a BA and a law degree. An attorney who has been deeply involved in the drafting of the Constitution, and of course has held judgeships at the very highest level all the way to the top of this country. It is a rare opportunity and a rare chance for us to hear from one of South Africa's greatest legal minds on an issue of importance to this conference. Ladies and gentlemen, please a very warm welcome for his honor, Judge Dehang Moseneke, the Deputy Chief Justice of the Constitutional Court of South Africa. Thank you, Judge. Thank you for a very kind introduction, Richard Quest. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Mr. President, I guess I should say, and to the incoming president, the CEO, Mr. Gopal, Mr. Quest, esteemed guests and ladies and gentlemen, it is indeed a privilege to join you on this wonderful morning. I'm somewhat intrigued that you giants of property in our country would want to have a lawyer and a judge at that in your midst on an occasion as special as this. You may very well be familiar with the story of a hostile business takeover in Chicago. The mafia stomped into the headquarters of a profitable and reputable liquor chain store in Chicago. Their guns were drawn and on the ready as they held up the headquarters. One of the mafia broadcasted rather loudly, this is a hostile takeover, but certainly no lawyers, no lawyers. The mafiosi had worked out that things go better without lawyers. <laughs> you may well be the worst of this morning for not having observed the dictum, certainly no lawyers. I'm nonetheless here and I'm grateful for being afforded the opportunity to reminisce, I was asked, over a century of intractable land and property arrangements in our country since the enactment of the 1913 Act. In the time you and I have this morning, I can only resort to broad brush strokes in telling a compelling story that straddles over a century. It is a tale replete with some of the worst of human foibles. War, division, exclusion, underdevelopment, exploitation and oppression. It is a story of human indignity and pain, but it's also a story of renewal, the story of a new dawn. In 1994, we made an avowed and collective commitment to heal the divisions of the past and to establish a society based on democratic values, social justice, and fundamental human rights. Put simply, we collectively undertook to turn our backs family on a miserable past as we, united in our diversity, seek to strive to improve the quality of life of all our citizens within a democratic setting, under a sovereign constitution, good governance, and the rule of law. That's what we set for ourselves. 
Many here may prefer to veer away from our shameful history that preceded our fresh start with the advent of democracy. And yet our undertaking to change our world can only be real if we know and acknowledge our past. We have from time to time to look into the mirror. History is important. As we forgive, we dare not forget how and why we came to need forgiveness in the first instance. There is only way we can shut the door firmly on a despicable past. Equally, we may never forget that our role and agency is located in the present, and even more importantly, in the future. I propose to talk briefly this morning about three things. First, I will narrate the history of land, property, and ownership in our land and its impact on our people. I propose to discuss land redress that was envisaged by new constitutional arrangements and property protection. And third, I evaluate rather briefly the legislative reform we introduced, <clears throat> and by we I mean the state, on land. And rather hastily, I'll look at what the courts have done in the last 20 years and a few concluding remarks. Well, let's get on with it. <clears throat> there have always been controversies around land in our country. But the most appropriate point to start must always be 100 years ago, when the Native Land Act in 1913 was passed. It represented, as you'll see in a moment, a climax. It can be validly argued that of the two and a half centuries of colonial incursion in the southern tip of our land, 1913 was a defining moment. Indigenous African people waged, by then had waged at least eight frontier wars along the receding borders of the Eastern Cape. Nkosi Dingani of the Zulu and his warriors wage wars warding off colonial dispossession in KwaZulu, Natal. A little later, at the end of the 19th century, we remember well, Morena Mushweshwe. Nkosi Ngungunyani, Khosi Khaswani, Khoshi Sikukune, leading their people and ultimately succumbed in various battles of dispossession just about the end of the 19th century. In the end, we all know indigenous people succumbed. They lost their right to land as conquest increased its grip. We must then turn to the 20th century, and at its turn, we saw secondary wars, the war between Dutch settlers and British settlers, the two Anglo-Boer wars, if you will, Freyets Wurlo, probably more appropriate, because it was a war of, trying to ward off British incursion, followed, as we'll remember, by the Peace Treaty of the Sand River, your high school history, which was concluded in 1909. And shortly thereafter, in 1910, the Union of South Africa was formed. It's again a negotiated constitution, sanctioned by the British Imperial Parliament, disenfranchised virtually all black people the new state was animated by the resolve to consolidate the colonial spoils of nearly two and a half preceding centuries and to protect its main stakeholders. And that they thought they would do best by imposing a constitution that would have racial, spatial, and economic separation. That was in 1910. One of the first acts the Union passed was the Native Land Act in 1913, 
In its initial terms, only 8% of the total land area of our country was reserved for native occupation. In 1936, land available for use by Africans was then increased by 5%, bringing the total to 13% of the total area of our country. I must quickly add that much of the land remained in the ownership of the state through the South African Development Trust. So in effect, African people owned no land after their conquest and the induction of the 1910 Union Act. So the legal artifice of a trust meant that in law, the land vested in the trustee. And we know who the trustee was, the government. And therefore, virtually, as I said, no black person, in effect, owned land by 1913. Many traditional communities, of course, continued living on the land. They grazed their cattle there, and they buried their dead there, but never acquired registered title, as it all vested in the trust. A few traditional communities managed to have their land converted into biding title. These they would have bought from farmers that had acquired title. And the most immediate example is the Royal Bafokan people, who rebought their land, and they're happy about the outcome today. Now, the main purpose of the 1930 Land Act were firstly to make more land available to white farmers, to regularize their title under the color of, of law, and not conquest. And its impact was, of course, was to impoverish black people through dispossession, prohibition of forms of farming arrangements that permitted food security and self-sufficiency. Thirdly, there was, of course, also the purpose of enforcing a policy of racial and spatial segregation, which had previously not been consistently enforced particularly the colonial governments in the Cape and in Natal. You'll remember that there some African people and colored people and Indian people were permitted qualified franchise, which was taken away in 1954 by the nationalist government. Therefore, the Native Land Acts, in effect, confined indigenous people to reserves near the remaining marginal portions of land which are mostly, we all know, it's fact, desolate and barren. Indigenous people were gradually converted from once successful farmers to poorly paid wage laborers. The Native Leg Act also abolished sharecropping system, which often was entered into between farmers and indigenous people. And labor tenancies that were alternative strategies for survival of indigenous people and access secondary access to land. Over time, therefore, a significant number of people, rural people, became laborers. But others remained in rural reserves, as we know, and became migrant workers. At best, they had a shaky link to land or any other form of fixed property. The social cost of the migrant labor system to indigenous people was and remains self-evident. Massive social devastation. In the next 40 years, more legislation was passed to reinforce the scheme of the Native Land Act. We all know the National Party took over government in 1948. And soon after, the Group Aidas Act was passed. You will live there and there only. It authorized the apartheid government to carry out forced removals of black people from urban land declared to be white areas, and to complete the policy of racial segregation by removing colored people and Indian people from their homes and businesses. This, of course, ladies and gentlemen, if you're as old as I am, conjures up the horrible memories of what? Grassroots struggles against forced removals in the District 6, in the Cape, in Ketomana, in Natal, in Sophia Town, in Johannesburg, in Lady Selborne, in Pretoria, as well as in Marabastad. These were struggles to resist forced removals and therefore loss of property and its ownership. In 1923, later in 1945, 
we saw the passage of the Black Urban Areas Act. It was prompted by the need to regulate the movement of black people who poured into urban areas as devastation increased in rural areas. They had lost all land and they had to find survival and they migrated to cities. This law was meant, as we know, to regulate the influx and the efflux of urban workers. Past laws were used to good effect in rooting out those people who are not strictly necessary for the primary and second industries that were developing in the urban periphery. Again, even in, <clears throat> beg your pardon, in that urban setting, until the introduction of a 99-year leasehold in the late 1980s, the law expressly prohibited land ownership and fixed property ownership by black persons residing in urban areas. If it were not enough, to good effect, just remember the 1951 Prevention of Legal Squatting Act, which was adopted. It was complemented with the Group Areas Act and other racially based laws. Its main thrust was to make provision for eviction of people who had no formal rights on land. It authorized the state and private landowners to evict people, to demolish their homes without court orders. In effect, most of those evicted had initially lived on the land with the consent of the owner, usually a farm owner. But once that consent was withdrawn, for whatever reason, people automatically were classified as squatters and became liable to be evicted. Put simply, it was legally permissible to evict your worker or any occupier at the whim of the owner without a court order, whether or not they had alternative accommodation. We know now millions of our people became squatters. Indeed, they remain squatters, are landless, they're homeless, and they're poor. That is the devastation caused by the 1913 Land Act and all the attendant laws that follow thereafter. To recap, and I'll take you out of your misery a moment, but I wanted you to look into the mirror. We have caused the devastation. To recap, the Native Land Act formalized colonial conquest and land dispossession by cloaking it in legal terms. In time, it was supported by a battery of racially based laws that deepened landlessness, lack of formal and lawfully recognized links with property. And that was true of the rural as well as the urban setting. And the inevitable impact to recap did not escape the indigenous people. They knew what the land, Native Land Act meant. And indeed, did not escape the attention of many progressive activists in our country. In great part, its passage spared the disenfranchised people to form the African National Congress in 1912. And that's why this act tends to enjoy its anniversary or centenary together with that of the African National Congress. So it was enough spare to get all of us to notice and to get off our seats and do something about our oppression. It is therefore not surprising that the struggle for liberation from colonial and apartheid domination was in great measure based on the objective of regaining the land, of rearranging relationship between people and property. This is also evident from the Freedom Charter of 1995 which said the goal of sharing the land, I quote, restriction on land ownership shall be ended. All the land redivided amongst those who work it to banish famine and hunger. All the Freedom Charter proclaims shall have the right to occupy land wherever they choose. The quote ends. The, therefore, the land question has dominated our relationships in this country. They've shaped our ideological thinking and positions. 
in most of our political formations, be they the Pan-Africanist Congress, the African National Congress, the Black Consciousness Movement, Communist Party, indeed a variety of working class formations, and landed owners of property. Faced with this mess, what did we do in 1994? 1994 came and promised a new dawn. The negotiating process, political rights, and fundamental guarantees were quickly agreed upon. There was hardly a debate on whether or not one person, one vote would be the formula that would underpin a new democratic order. Some of the first concessions that the National Party made right up front, early, and quite smart too. Entrenching, for instance, a catalog of fundamental rights was a given. Their formulation was readily accessible in a variety of international covenants and declarations of fundamental rights and freedoms. However, no matter was more contested than the property guarantee. Where there should be any at all. And if there is any, whether it should rank as a fundamental right in our constitution. The interim constitution, this is what we started with in 1993, left a fully blown property clause to the final constitution. They were smart and cautious to avoid an intractable deadlock. And for that and other reasons, the interim constitution did not contain a detailed provision on property rights or on land reform. Section 28 of the Interim Constitution was crafted carefully to non-committal, in non-committal terms. Because many were weary to entrench past acquisitions of right and the devastation I had just described to you in a moment ago. Its terms simply read, every person shall have the right to acquire and hold property right to hold rights in property, every person shall have the right to acquire and to hold rights in property, and to the extent that the nature of the right permits to dispose of such rights. So the provisions were futuristic. They did not seek to deal with the past, but to entrench the right going forward. And sub two says, no deprivation of any rights in property shall be permitted otherwise that in accordance with the law. So the second principle was that if there's going to be any activity around property, it will be within the context of the law. In other words, there'll be no invasions, there'll be no unlawful conduct. It will be mediated around the space that the law creates. Therefore, Section 28 further assured all that where rights in property were expropriated, as I said, in accordance with law, and it shall be permissible only if it is for public purpose. And it shall further be subject to payment of an agreed compensation or compensation determined by a court. So that was the first step at trying to find an accord around this intractable question of land and property. The legal effect of these provisions, I'll explain very briefly, seem to have been that interim constitution protected the right to acquire, to hold, and to dispose in the future, and protected that class of property against expropriation if it is not for a public purpose. So you wouldn't walk over to your neighbor and take their property. You will have to pursue a public purpose. And it will be against an agreed or equitable compensation. Equally striking at that early time was that <clears throat> the right to existing property was not written in as a fundamental right. Alongside other rights, rights to dignity, to free expression, 
to integrity of the person, right of movement. It did not rank that high. It must be added that there was also a provision directed at land redress in the initial stages in the form of right to restitution of land for persons and com communities dispossessed of such lands. Of course, we remember that the interim constitution was short-lived and it was intended to be a transitional constitution. It gave way to the 1996 constitution which was drafted by a democratically elected constituent assembly. And we thought that would optimize its legitimacy that the constitution be drafted after the election. Some in the liberation movements argued against the property clause at that stage. That would guarantee the existing property rights on the grounds that this would hamper efforts by the democratic government to carry out programs of land reform. It was also argued that to entrench existing property rights in the new constitution was to legitimize and entrench as a human right the consequences of generations of transgressions and dispossession. In contrast, the negotiators, particularly from the past government, argued strongly for inclusion of such a clause to ensure that land would not be nationalized and transferred to the land-hungry majority without compensation to current owners. To those of us who sat around the table and invited to write, I can tell you that probably was the biggest test in our transition. Eventually, all parties agreed to a text that would be included in the Bill of Rights. And that made the settlement possible, I suppose. Let's look at the property clause briefly and move on quickly to some closing remarks. The 1966 text was, a more, detail, was more detailed, firstly, about land reform. It has located the property protection, as I've said, in the Bill of Rights. But in its text, stopped short of guaranteeing anyone the right to property. The primary protection in Section 25 of the Constitution is couched as a compromise and it is in negative terms. I invite you to take time and read it sometime. It reads, no one may be deprived of property except in terms of a law of general application. And no law may permit arbitrary deprivation of property. So we know two important things. When you hold property, you may not be deprived of the property, except by a law of general application. So there could be a law that could actually authorize deprivation of property. And if such a law is made, it will not permit arbitrary deprivation. Textually, the protection is against arbitrary deprivation of property. However, deprivation may occur through law of general application, as I've said, provided it's not arbitrary. So we don't wake up one morning and decide to take everybody's backyard and use it for one thing or the other. It has to be done with the context of a law and must pursue some legitimate government purpose. And the law may not be irrational and may not be to pursue anything other than what is legitimate and a valid governmental purpose. A school, a road, a clinic, a training center, or some other vital thing that would change the course of our collective lives. The property clause also provides for the power of the state to expropriate private property for public purposes. There is, of course, a difference between expropriation and deprivation. Deprivation speaks to temporary and limited form of deprivation of property. You may not drive your car here. You may not use your property for this purpose. You may not sell alcohol. All these are deprivations on how you may use your property. However, expropriation is 
in very simple terms, an actual takeaway of somebody's property by the state. That the Constitution permits, provided it is in the public interest and subject to just and equitable compensation. Public interest is specifically defined to include the nation's commitment to land reform and to reforms to bring about equitable access to all South Africans' natural resources. So a government could pass laws that were directed to bring about a more equitable access to all South African natural resources. Section 25, free in particular of the same clause says, the amount, the timing, and the manner of payment of compensation must be just and equitable. Reflecting an equitable balance between public interests and the interests of those affected have in regard to the following factors, and the Constitution lists these factors up front. The current use of the property, the history, its acquisition of the property, its use, the market value of the property, the extent of direct state, state investment and subsidy and acquisition, beneficial capital improvements on the property, and the purpose of the expropriation. I must, ladies and gentlemen, then pause to remark that our Constitution carries no provision that embodies a requirement of a willing buyer, willing seller. There are no such words in the Constitution. Everyone whose property is expropriated must be for a purpose the Constitution of arises and against payment of equitable compensation. The willingness of the buyer and or of the seller may well facilitate a smooth transaction, but does not seem to be a constitutional requirement at all. The Constitution provides much more solid and better protections than willingness of any of the parties. The property clause, therefore, em embodies a claim to immunity against uncompensated expropriation to private property in addition, the clause includes specific provisions on land reform, which impose obligations on the state to bring about greater access to land. Moreover, these provisions embody three different aspects of enhancing access to land, which are re re restitution, redistribution, and land tenure reform. To recap, the bargain is there will be no interference with property, deprivation, or taking away property without compensation on the one hand, and on the other, the state is obliged to adopt measures which will increase and enhance access to land. And the law defines this in three categories, restitution, redistribution, and land tenure. It's a delicate balance, and it has certain consequences to the kind of jurisprudence and what the courts have done up until now. Briefly, restitution relates to land rights that have been dispossessed in terms of apartheid laws. And most of you are well familiar with all the land claims that are winding their way through the courts very slowly. They relate to restitution of land rights, and the law has been passed to that effect. Improvement of security of tenure to those whose land rights have been weakened by apartheid laws. We've talked about that. And that explains why the government has the pine law to convert and has converted most of the title in the townships into freehold title and not rental title as it was for many, many years. And the third measure government is obliged to do is to introduce measures to increase access to land. To that end, the government has passed many laws. The Restitution of Land Rights Act, the Land Reform Act, the Extension of Security of Tenure Act, the Development Facilitation Act, the Upgrading of Land Tenure Act, the Interim Protection of Informal Land Rights Act, 
Criminal Property Association Act. They all share the same purpose, that is to secure land rights for people who are previously deprived of land. They all refer to disadvantaged and vulnerable communities and groups of people in our society. The most recent version of all this legislation is the Communal Land Rights Act, and which was intended to be an instrument by the Department of Land Affairs to give effect to tenure security and retrospective state-owned land. The question must be asked whether our lot has changed because of these laws. I pause for a moment as I draw to a close to look for instance at the restitution of the Land Rights Act, which permits persons who have lost their property as a result of apartheid laws of, or racial discriminatory practice after 1913. It is packed on the Na Native Land Act. Claims were submitted over large tracts of land in our country. Towards the end of the decade, about 36,489 claims were settled, involving about 8,500 households. But there was only about a quarter of the total claims. So the whole 75% of claims which are still outstanding out there. For Evan claims, it is recorded that there's been financial compensation for victims of forced removals. We've talked about that. The total compensation of about 1.2 billion. But again, it's just about a fifth of the claims that actually have been made. And therefore, 100 years later, we must ask whether the restitution of land has promoted greater land equity. Sitting as I do as a judge, I must tell you that the objective of legislation may have fallen victim to overlawyering, bad decision, underperforming bureaucracy. The cases are few. They're winding their way slowly through the courts, and very little has, in effect, changed. Every legal point is being taken up to our very court. In short, restitution of land is by and large smothered under the burden of legal formalism, low access, bureaucratic bangles, and little has changed. I've talked about redistribution of land. It is permissible. In my formal text, I've set out the details of the circumstances and, and, the, and, and the law that permits them to happen. Well, what have the courts done about all this? In other words, in essence, where are we at a real life level? A good starting point might be to remind ourselves that we have a common law. We inherited it from our Roman Dutch past. And in it stands quite an interesting maxim. Quis est soli um et caelam et art inferos. For those who have had time to study Latin at one stage, as I had to. Ownership of land includes everything above the property up to the heavens and below the center of the earth. There is a Roman notion of what ownership is. Everything above your land, everything below your land is yours. And it will be a convenient point to start because our, our jurisprudence drawn from our constitutional values has made fairly major departures from this notion of ownership. And therefore the notion of dominium of absolute ownership has those feudal origins and was meant to be absolute in content. That explained why, <clears throat> under the common law, owners were entitled to near absolute power. Everything else had to yield to the right to own, to enjoy, to dispose of property. 
That is true of mineral rights and mineral ownership of mineral rights, for instance. The result being that the access to the country's mineral wealth pre-1994 was inextricably bound with ownership of the land. And we know history tells us what happened to that ownership. And that led to hugely unequal distribution of the country's natural wealth. Courts, including the court where I work, have developed over the past 20 years, since the adoption of the Constitution, a jurisprudence on property and its protection with, within a constitutional and not a common law context. In other words, we have said in a variety of judgments, property rights must be seen and viewed <clears throat> within the context of their special and unique function. Their goodness, not only to individuals, but to society at large. As we've heard, existing property rights may be interfered with, but only within the context of our Constitution. And courts have emphasized that it will happen only in that context. It will be lawful. It will be constitutionally authorized. But not always with the consent of the owner who is entitled to compensation. And if the truth be told, no constitutional property clause can guarantee existing property holdings indefinitely and absolutely if it is not within the context of an ever-increasing <clears throat> participation by the, larger, by the larger community. Put more tightly, no property guarantee we've set as courts can survive the existence and absolute insulation if unjust and unequitable distributions continue. And therefore, the government and us have a fundamental duty. To ensure that we move towards a much more fairer arrangement as contemplated by the Constitution. So therefore, ours in law now is a wider rather than a narrow concept of property and what is appropriate. Even compensation itself is not premised on market value only, but on several calculations that courts have to build into it. And absent an agreement, courts, the Constitution appoints as a final arbiters of what would be just an equitable remuneration. We've done a few other things in the past 20 years in balancing rights between ownership and other interests in society. We've, for instance, insisted the squatter, so-called, will never be evicted without alternative accommodation. We have departed from un unqualified terms under which ownership was understood in the past. We have ordered cities, indeed both the city of Cape Town and the city of Johannesburg, to find alternative accommodation for persons who occupy private land and have no other homes. We have required private land owners to exercise patience as we find alternative homes for those who have no homes. That is part of an exercise to find an equitable balance between the private and the public interest in the face of very vast homelessness and landlessness. I've paged past several pages to go to my conclusion, and these may be read at your leisure when you find it appropriate. I say much about what the courts have done in relation to mineral rights and property, what the courts have done in relation to fairness in eviction. And remarkably, 
We've had no case, not even one, coming up to the Constitutional Court on compensation. And if we go through our law reports, there is no significant disputes that have occurred around expropriation. The explanation might be that the negotiations go rather well, and we're in a placid country, and issues of fair distribution of land and properties, access and use, and exploitation are being well managed. Or it may mean so little is being done that in fact there's never been an owner who has rushed to our court, and I'd expect to have had that in 20 years, and say my property has been taken and I have not been fairly compensated. I'm uncertain at this stage whether we're doing well or we're doing so little. Our government is doing so little around redistribution of land that in fact there is no conflict. I would want to hope for the more positive speculation. But courts are simply not seized with battles around land. It may be a good thing. I must end. Our transition to a constitutional democracy has often been called a miracle. It is, depending on where you stand, it is not, again, depending on your world view and your take on history. I want to suggest it's a result of 360 years of intense contestation and struggle for a just society. What we have collectively done, and that's a happy note, we should be a proud people, we have painstakingly constructed a constitutional democracy, brick by brick, the scaffolding is up and the construction is on. We have crafted institutions that undergird a free and open democracy. And we are a free and open democracy. We have regular elections. We have an independent electoral commission, which is yet to be accused of impropriety. It's a good body. We have good, if not a few, chapter nine institutions that do their work quite well in our country to guard our multi-party democracy. We have a free press. We have a vibrant civil society. If you did something unto what, you're in public office in this country, you'll hear about it. It doesn't matter who you are. We have a patriotic business center, sector, that continues to create jobs and to make significant contributions to the coffers of our country. That's why we can pay our public bills, because our businesses pay taxes. I'm yet to convict a businessman who hasn't paid his or her taxes. They also stay out of court and happily so. We don't want to see them there. We have a vigilant working class and working class formations. It's a good thing. We have the rule of law and an independent judiciary. And where I work, I want you to sleep well. It's my commitment and the commitment of our colleagues that as you enter into and sign off transactions, the law will enforce them. So they must continue to prosper, provided they are consistent with the broader parameters of our Constitution. To recap, therefore, we are there for you. We are there to make sure that we have a judiciary that does its work, of which I'm a very proud co-leader, in order to allow you space 
to develop our near barren continent. We have also done much to change our world, and yet there's still much to be done. I'm now not going to rehash the triple burden of poverty, unemployment, and equality, and I hear you're going to be talking about it. Please do. Let it suffice to say that the Constitution and the laws made under its sway sought to reverse those terrible tales I told you about the Native Land Act. And we should commit and continue to try and do that. It's in our interests. Landlessness still abounds, and it is sad. Many remain homeless. The land distribution has hardly shifted for nearly 100 years. Percentage is pretty much the same, 87 13%. Land right restoration claims have been few, slow, and ineffectual, I've said. Many restoration claims appear to have been bogged down in bureaucratic delay and winding litigation. Where restoration of land has occurred, the new incumbents appear ill-prepared for the new roles of land ownership and food production. Moreover, urban migration has not abated. <clears throat> we see the number of cases we deal with in our courts. Rural homesteads have been left for overcrowded and squalid urban informal living. So the dream of instituting an idyllic countryside for our country is proving elusive, is yet to be realized. And I'm not suggesting that we have not built many low-cost homes. We have. Or that we have not converted many tenuous titles of land into free old title. At no cost to ho title holders, we have. What I'm saying is that by now, we should have converted the trust lands, for instance, so defined in the Trust Act, which is still alive in just a new form, into family or other freehold titles to fuel rural funding and development. We must find new beneficial and innovative ways to secure land, property, and, and, and equity. The ample constitutional and legal instruments to tackle the job at hand without deleterious impact on existing property businesses. And yet, we are not doing it. Seemingly, very little has been done to facilitate land redress, I've said many times. One would have imagined that a court such as ours would have seen a large flow of disputes. As I told you, it's all quiet, and I'm happy it is quiet, provided we do the work. We can only ignore our history, and we can only ignore the vital requirements of our constitutional democracy and the needs for social justice at our very peril. Thank you for listening, and God bless. Stay there, Judge. Stay there. Stay there, Judge. What is he up to? One of the few privileges of to tell judges what to do. Stay there. <laughs> <laughs> one question, just one. And I'm aware, of course, that I must not lead you into temptation <laughs> or take you down paths that could be judicially inconvenient. So the question is this, Judge. What do you think is the biggest threat, the biggest constitutional threat that South Africa faces at the moment? Uh-oh. <laughs> I'm a sitting judge, Richard Quest. <laughs> I'm not a retired judge. Yet. <laughs> Let's wait for the answer. <laughs> so, Judge, let me rephrase the question then. In, in, the, in, in the great annals of, of, that you've just talked about, freedom of speech, government, good governance, all those issues that you talked about, where do you put property rights? <laughs> 
as being an important constitutional importance and right. Where in the list of things for constitutional importance would you put it? Well, let, let's start with your first question in any event. I mean, we have a covenant concluded in 1994. The covenant seeks to migrate us from one ugly space to a good space. And it requires all of those things to happen. We, mu we must have an open society. We must transparent governance. We need good governance. The Constitution says so. It's all there written down. We need accountable governance. We need to allow all the right to practice their occupation and trade, section 22 of the Constitution, and to allow people to hold property, to develop it. In tandem with that, obviously, we have to look for equity imposed on us by our unequal past. So the threats would be all those things that go into it. If you want to close down on society and make it as, not an open but a secret society, if you, if you deny opportunities for, for most of your people, if you don't allow business to, to flourish, because the Constitution would like to see that, um, all of these would be enormous threats. Coming to property, it is inevitable given our history that our notions of property must on the one hand be protective and on the other ameliorative. We must find that balance. Judge, when you have retired, and one hopes it's many years from now, you'll come back and answer the question again. <laughs> uh, stay where you are, Neil. <laughs> the, the Chief Executive, you. you're honored, Judge. Uh, yeah, uh, yes, you will, of course, Judge. You, you, you'll declare it appropriately <laughs> on, the, on the relevant form at the relevant time. Ladies and gentlemen, the judge. <laughs>